So, welcome everybody to our panel on COVID-19 and uh, climate change. My name is uh, Ralf Fuchs. I'm the director of the Center for Liberal Modernity, a Berlin-based think tank dealing with uh, the renewal of uh, liberal democracy and the challenges we are facing among them climate change, finding liberal answers to uh, these uh, challenges, and dealing with the authoritarian threat from um, within and from authoritarian powers, uh, which are meanwhile competing with liberal democracies like uh, China also in terms of uh, climate change or how to deal with COVID-19. Um, In the short time, in the short term, COVID-19 seems to be the more urgent and uh, traumatic challenge we are we are facing. But uh, behind the p pandemic, there's another, maybe even um, more dangerous uh, crisis looming. If global warming will spiral out of control, it will threaten the livelihood of uh, billions of people, affecting every aspect of our life agriculture, water, biodiversity, health, migration, um, also international relations and geopolitics. Interestingly, COVID-19 as well as uh, climate change are fueling uh, a very strong public and political impact of scientific findings and science-based policies. So follow the science uh, seems to be um, becoming more and more um, a kind of political um, guideline. Um, but at the same time, uh, COVID-19 as, as well as uh, climate change is strengthening a tendency uh, towards strong government, uh, strengthening the dominance of... Um, governments over parliaments and, and uh, even over the public deliberation. Um, so this is a, a very interesting similar uh, the parallel between both crises. Um, and compared to COVID-19, uh, climate change seems to be a much more complex challenge. Uh, there is not a single root cause like a virus uh, but a, multi a multitude of sources of greenhouse gases uh, from agriculture, our energy system, um, car traffic, aviation, shipping, uh, key industries uh, like uh, chemistry. Uh, so um, greenhouse gases causing global warming are deeply inscripted. Um, in the fossil fuel driven industrial system and uh, modern lifestyles. So how can we effectively stop global warming or at least keep it significantly below two uh, degrees uh, Celsius, which seems to be um, an ultimate uh, critical threshold uh, to, to keep uh, global warming under, under control? Is it about self-restriction? Uh, 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 shrinking uh, than our consumptions, um, restricting our mobility, um, or restriction by government, slowing down the economy, uh, reducing um, transport, uh, bringing tourism down to almost zero, which we are facing now in the context of uh, the corona crisis. Is it about governance uh, by strict rules, um, limiting uh, basic rights like freedom of mobility, uh, private entrepreneurship, and cutting down social life to, to a minimum? Is this a, a, a role model for fighting climate change? Or is it the other way around? Does the transition towards climate neutral, uh, neutrality require more economic dynamics, more innovation and large-scale 
investment in order to uh, reconstruct our energy and transport system, to rebuild our cities and uh, key dang industries. So do we need more control and command? Or is there an alternative pathway towards sustainability in line with liberal values, plurality of lifestyles and um, individual liberties? This is more or less the overarching uh, framework of our today's uh, discussion. Um, I am now uh, briefly introducing uh, our panelists. Um, and I start uh, with welcoming Hannah Lübert, uh, who is with me here on the uh, stage in uh, Berlin. Um, she is a member of the Youth Council of uh, the Generation Foundation and co-author of You Don't Have a, a Clue, That's Why We Have to Step In. Welcome, Hannah. Um, at home, uh, so only virtually, um, then with us, um, I will start with Carolina Vigura from Cultura Liberalna um, from Warsaw. Uh, and the, she's also a member of the advisory board of uh, NECA and a good friend um, and uh, a bright intellectual. Welcome, uh, Carolina. Um, the you. next one, Viviane Radatz, uh, she is a senior policy advisor uh, on climate and energy uh, for the WWF uh, in, in, in Germany with a lot of uh, knowledge and experience in environmental uh, policies. And last but not least, uh, Michael Jakob. He is senior researcher at the Mercator, uh, Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change, one of the outstanding German uh, think tanks uh, dealing with the issues we are, we are talking about uh, today. So I would like to, to invite Hannah to then open the debate with some thoughts on um, the parallelities and differences between COVID-19 and climate change. And if you see any, I would say, opportunity uh, in the, the current quite bleak situation uh, we are in, how ca can we get out, uh, how can we change uh, threats into the opportunities? Yeah, first of all, oh, can you hear me all? Um, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, well, when this crisis began about half a year ago, um, I heard a lot of people talking about it as like a big chance, maybe the chance that we need to overcome and tackle the global climate crisis. And at first, it kind of seemed like they were right, because we saw emissions drop globally uh, by about 4 to 5 percent which is actually the largest drop that we have seen in human history and which is a larger reduction in emissions that we have uh, achieved by any kinds of climate policies so far. But I think that uh, the longer this crisis has endured, the more it became clear that this is not the whole story. And um, if we look more closely, then we can see, or then we have to ask ourselves the question, at whose expenses do those drops in emission occur at the moment? And in case of the lockdown and the restrictions due to Corona, unfortunately, the people that are suffering the most from it are the ones who are the most vulnerable in our society anyways. Like for example, people in risk groups, elderly people, chronically ill people are dying and people are losing their jobs and losing their means of existence. Um, and those are often the people who are um, the poorest off anyways. So. I think that in this way, this is actually the opposite of the kind of climate action that we need. The real kind of climate policy that I am pushing for, that my generation has been pushing for for months now, is, is our policies that can uh, protect the means of livelihoods for future generations while also protecting and establishing social justice within the current society and within the current uh, generations. So this is the first point. And the second point, which I think is maybe even more important, is that these kinds of emission reductions that we have seen due to corona are not the ones that are gonna to, uh, going to save our climate in the long term. Because in order to be able to stay within the 1.5 um, degrees limit, 
We need to constantly and coherently drop our emissions until they final, finally reach a point of carbon neutrality. But um, the, the reductions that we have seen so far are only because of a temporary halt to global economy. And as soon as the economy will, will keep going, the emissions are going to grow again. And um, for example, in the last financial crisis, crisis, we have seen that once the um, economy um, kept going again, the emissions grew even faster than before. So um, we are now at the exact same point in time where we are facing a huge danger of these so-called rebound effects. And um, I was kind of hopeful for the past months that these stimulus packages that needed to be passed by governments in order to like, uh, stimulate the economy and uh, make it recover would actually use this potential, this, this point in time where the economy comes to unhold to, to rethink the very way that we business works and to, to trigger this innovation, this transformation to renewable energy that we need. But um, if we look at what has happened actually here in Germany but also globally, I feel like my hope, the hopes of my generations have kind of been disappointed because most stimulus packages that have been passed were actually um, means of um, generating economic boom as soon as possible while delaying this kind of transformation that we need. I think this becomes especially clear if we look at, for example, the fact that um, globally, if you look at all the money that has um, gone into stimulus packages, twice as much money has gone to the fossil fuel industry and the conventional industry than to renewable and sustainable ways of um, businesses. So to kind of end on a positive note, and because I'm a big fan of staying hopeful anyways, I think there are um, two main chances that remain for the future going forward. One of them is that now that we have the new lockdown and businesses need to pause and uh, come to an hold, probably new stimulus packages will be needed. And if we push enough and make our voices heard um, from the climate and social justice movement, maybe this time the, the packages will be actual, actual in a, um, yeah, investments into our future. But I think this will not happen um, by itself, but only if enough people push for it. And this is uh, where I see the second chance. Because since the climate crisis and the corona crisis share some similarities, especially that they show us as we, uh, that we are vulnerable, that we are not invincible as humanity, that nature can be dangerous if we push it too hard, and that we need to prevent crises in order to protect human lives, maybe more people are going to wake up to the immense danger of, of climate change and will start to get active, start to get organized in order to, to tackle this emergency. But I think um, what this all comes down to actually is the fact that nothing ever is a chance in itself. It is only a chance if we decide to make it one and if we decide to take it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Hannah. Um, next one, maybe Michael uh, Jacob. Um, so where do you see these structural sim similarities and differences between um, the corona crisis and uh, then global warming and um, so where are the the um, maybe catalytic points we we, we can make use of um, to uh, turn this crisis into kind of a better future yeah thank you very much um to start, I would like to say I agree with many things that just have been said, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this great presentation. Um, regarding the similarities between COVID-19 and climate change, I think the two most important similarities are first, um, that both are some kind of problem of collective action, that you need people to cooperate. Um, second, it's about making large-scale changes to society, to our economic activity, to actually the way we are doing things. And as you've seen, change has happened very quickly, many aspects of our lives, the way we treat each other, this social distancing, wearing masks, home office, and so on. Many things have gone tremendously quickly. But what's the big difference to climate change? I think the most important difference is that climate change is sometimes called psychologically distant. That means 
the most important impacts of climate change will not be felt by ourselves, will not be felt by our friends and families, but will be felt by people living in the future, by people living in countries far away. And our societies are not really made up, we don't have this moral compass to think in this very long-term, very cosmopolitan perspective. And that makes it much harder actually to deal with climate change than dealing with COVID-19. Um, regarding the changes we've seen, I think there are some hopeful signs. So, for instance, mobility has changed. More people are using bikes. More people are staying at home. Transport emissions are falling. Um, we see some green aspects of stimulus packages, which could actually help to steer um, energy systems in the right direction to actually incentivize energy system transformations. Also, what I very much appreciate, as you mentioned in the beginning, that we have more trust in science, that science really has been singled out as a trustworthy source of information, of actually guidance for social action. And I also think it's important that at least we have a stronger feeling of we are into this together. We have some kind of solidarity. We have to care for each other, for other people, even though it doesn't extend beyond borders and beyond generations so far. On the other hand, um, there are also some really worrisome developments, like for instance, more people are using the car now. Um, we don't have, uh, trans public transport is declining and this might actually lock in behavioral patterns for a long time that people um, don't actually appreciate public transport anymore. Also, if you look at stimulus packages, um, even though coal has been phased out or is on the way on, uh, out on many countries, other countries, for instance, China, have actually pledged to bring back coal plants that have already been decommissioned in order to stimulate the economy. And this could actually lock in um, carbon intensive infrastructure for decades if these coal plants are really built. And in the long term, um, I'd also be concerned about the social and political consequences. So think about unemployment. If many people now lose their jobs, actually, there might be this discussion. We cannot afford greenery in such a, a, a um, situation. We now have to help people to have employment if you cannot afford climate policy. So this is something um, I'm really worried about. And I think we now have to steer the discussion in the right direction. And as has already been said, never let a serious crisis go to waste. We now have an opportunity to steer economic developments, social developments, political developments in the right direction. But this really requires some proactive stands from our side. This really um, demands taking the right decisions. Thanks so a lot, Michael. Vianne <laughs> Radetz. Um, we will talk um, on the European Green Deal, I think, in the next round of our conversation. But um, maybe um, you could reflect a little bit on the policy answers up to now. Um, interestingly, and I guess this is a more promising sign, as uh, also Hannah was quite critical about the concrete packages which had been uh, decided by, by the European Union and uh, the national governments, um, that the, the policy answer to the economic recession, which has been Uh, caused by by, co by COVID-19, the decline of uh, the, our our economies was, we have to use this as an opportunity uh, to renew the, our our e economies. So it's not just about um, let's uh, uh, continue um, uh, business as usual. No, it's uh, I, I think. Uh, the, the message is already there uh, that we have to reconstruct our, our economies in a, in a different way coming out of this crisis. So what do you think about it? Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I agree with very many things that were already said um, by um, the last two speakers. I would like to stress though on the 
on what we have seen in short-term reductions in the past, that's really, that's absolutely not sustainable. And um, it's something that I think in the, it showed us in a way that we can change a lot very quickly, as uh, Michael Jacob also said, but we also need to um, take this forward in a more constructive way. And for me, for if, if you ask me about the chances out of the COVID crisis also for um, climate mitigation, I had two things that are more encouraging and I have two things that I think are more the caveats that we really have to work on now. And one of the things uh, that I found more encouraging was actually the way um, recovery packages were set up because it's not because they are perfect. They are very far from perfect and they are also uh, still maintaining the status quo as to the fossil world. But we've seen some movement um, in these recovery packages um, that or at least for Germany, we have like 30 to 40 percent that you can um, assess goes into climate infrastructure, uh, especially in transforming industry and all these things that haven't been tackled so far. So for me, this is encouraging. And I would like to pick one thing out for Germany that I find is a real game changer. And this is not handing out bailouts to internal combustion engines um, within the recovery package. And we have seen that this is making a change, a very big change, because the uh, sales of combustion engines are so far not coming back while electric vehicles are soaring um, in, in sales. So this is only one aspect and it's really not enough. But for Germany, this makes me, it's, it's, I find it encouraging because it's, it also shows that even in a car country like Germany, we can have this switch. We can actually um, get into other gears, basically. The other thing that I found encouraging over the last months was actually that the climate policies were not falling off the agenda. It was a big fear in the beginning that now everything will be COVID and nobody will drive any kind of climate policies. And it hasn't actually materialized. Um, we, we've, we've had a lot of effort on the Green Deal, on the climate law um, within the European Union. I will stress that none of this is enough to actually fulfill the Paris targets or to um, securely reach climate neutrality at a point uh, where we need it. But it is not off the; it has not fallen off the agenda, and it's very much um, in all political um, um, processes. So, on the caveat side, though, what has not actually made the agenda is that. We need early action. This is also something that's so similar to COVID that the, the earlier you act, um, you get uh, the better the results you get and you really have to pull through. And we, we, we saw this with COVID in the first uh, um, lockdown period. And now we're already much more skeptical um, about um, shutting down public life, even though we have actually much higher infection rates than we had in the spring. Um, you are actually there in a, in, in, in a public uh, arena, basically. Um, and this is the same with climate, just uh, a lot less visible. The effects are not visible now, and we don't go into these early action things. We've, we've seen policies, we've seen it in the recovery packages, but what we're not seeing is actual policies on the ground that, that pick this up, that pick up the spirit from the recovery packages and that pick up um, the spirit that's somehow there, that climate policy is needed. And that's for me a real big caveat because what we're now facing is in the next 10 years is Action is everything. So we need to basically do everything we can and not talk about so much, uh, you know, about the whole narratives and stuff. And the other thing that's for me a caveat, I know I'm a bit over the time, I'm sorry, um, is the cooperation that's needed and to take the people along. I think this has been... A, 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 you can see also with COVID that it has been much easier in the first uh, phase in spring to actually... Um, get people to be on board. Um, it's much uh, much more difficult now to bring people along on this, uh, you know, to cooperate and this whole solidarity and um, creativeness thing that we saw in the spring for this lockdown is basically gone. And I think this is also for climate, um, this is a very a serious message. We really need to have other ways to, co um, to communicate and to cooperate to make all the action that's needed happen. And that's for me a big thing that's not been addressed so far. And we see big rifts. I'm not talking about what's keeping us all on the edge of our seats with the US elections, but there you see the rifts that we also see here that people are just not, or, or that it's hard or it seems harder to bring people on board. I stop there.
Thanks a lot, Viviane, and also thank you for reminding us to the elephant in the room of the still pending U.S. elections uh, and, and the outcome, of course, will also have a, a very heavy impact on uh, the global governance on, on, on climate change, yes or no. Um, so, Carolina Vigura, um, maybe in addition uh, to what you, you anyway wanted uh, uh, to, to, to say, you can reflect a little bit um, on uh, I would say the shift in the um, relationship uh, between um, strong government um, as uh, the, the 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 actor of in in, in the, the the crisis. You know, this uh, crisis are the hours of the executive, um, the branches of of our governments, um, and. What, of course, is a basic quality of liberal democracies than public deliberation and and uh, the whole thinking about alternatives. Yeah, we 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 tend now more and more. To say, there is no alternative. Uh, the famous Margaret Thatcher uh, saying from the uh, 90s. Um, so there is no alternative uh, than to to deal with COVID-19 in in a certain way, or to deal with climate change in a, in a in a certain way. And science is telling us what we have to do. So, uh, what do you think about these kind of uh, tensions rising? Um, thank you very much, Ralph. At, and at the same time, uh, thank you for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. I do have some logistic problems here because my five years old uh, son is a little bit nervous. So uh, please let me help him first and then I will speak because otherwise it will not be possible. Uh, j just give me, j give me 20 minutes, 20 seconds, okay? This is home office. The reality of home office of uh, working mums. <laughs> And That's dance. why you need a couple more screens than the one you're on. Yeah. <laughs> so, Carolina, would you like to wait a moment or can you step in? Okay, we're all set to go. We can try. At least we can try. And I hope uh, it will be possible. So thank you very much, Ralph, for this question. So actually, it's exactly what I wanted to start with, because I do believe that the question, the initial question of this debate, at least of this first round, uh, namely, will the COVID uh, crisis become a catalysator for change, uh, brings me to speaking about three paradoxes, and strong government is one of them. Uh, but I will start with with another uh, paradox, if you if you allow, and then I will come back to 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 strong government or authoritarianism, or or as you as you like to to call it. So um, you, you probably are aware of the film of Jean Pierre Jeannet, uh, which is called The Very Long Engagement. Uh, one of the first scenes of this movie is a scene when the main heroine is um, uh, is chasing a car in which her fiancé is taken away to the First World War. And she is uh, running after the car and crossing the spiral road on which the car is, is moving away. And she says, if I am able to chase the car, I will see him again. Then you have the whole film and the whole plot. And I won't spoil too much when I say that in the very end, she, her expectations are met and not met at the very same time. So it's a very important philosophical question about what, ex, what, what expectations are and how they are fulfilled by reality. And I do believe that what we are facing when we are uh, talking about the COVID-19 as being a catalyzator for a good change in climate saving, this is a, a, exactly the paradox of, of, um, of expectations. So what we will uh, receive actually after this crisis will meet and not meet our expectations at the same time. And the reason for this is that 
politics uh, of states uh, during the COVID-19 crisis is very similar to, uh, to actually curing the patients. Namely, if there are any diseases that are accompanying COVID-19, you know very well, uh, those patients are doing worse than others. And exactly the same happens with the states. So, so, so of course, some states will work on their democracy, will work on, on changing this, this, this drop in CO2 emissions, for example, because the crisis has shown something very important, but others will not. Because in, in fact, the, the COVID-19 is a catalysator, it, indeed it is, but it is a catalysator of the reality that we have had on already before. So in those countries where the discussion about climate was already strong and already vital, probably this discussion will continue in a very uh, fruitful way. But in other countries where um, the work to be done was avoided by many political strategies, for example, by illiberal populist strategies, I, I'm afraid the, the, the COVID-19 will be catalyst catalysator of something else and not necessarily of good outcomes. So this is the first paradox, the paradox of, of, of expectations. The second, ex the, the second paradox is, is, is the paradox of expecting that uh, um, um, a simultaneous crisis would bring something good, would transfer some knowledge from fighting with pandemic to fighting with the climate change. But I do believe uh, we should be very realistic here. Namely, those two crises are a simultaneous. This is true, of course. But apart from this, this fact that they are both happening at the same time and that they are telling us something about how vulnerable our presence here on Earth is, we actually cannot uh, have very many other common characteristics. So, for example, science knows quite a lot about the climate change, but actually science doesn't know too much about COVID-19. Uh, as for the climate change, I do believe that there are already some solutions that are known, but as for the COVID-19, we actually don't, do not have either a cure uh, neither a cure nor a vaccine. So, um, so, 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 this is important that we that we are aware of that. And also, uh, what what um, what what my predecessor, pre pre previous panelists have been uh, mentioning. Of course, there was some drop in the CO2 emissions uh, globally in the first wave of the pandemic. But we are already aware of the fact that it's not. Uh, it's not so so uh, so simple anymore because, for example, as Michael has said, more people are using cars. So this is um, uh, the second paradox, the paradox of the two simultaneous um, uh, crises. And the third paradox is exactly the, the paradox of the strong government. So um, we, we have seen uh, through the last eight months that those governments that are more democratic and more liberal uh, are actually dealing with the pandemic better than those governments uh, which wanted to appear to be very strong or even uh, displayed an authoritarian streak. So we have observed, for example, uh, you mentioned Ralph um, Donald Trump. Donald Trump does display an authoritarian streak, but the pandemic uh, has been a deep, deep crisis and perhaps even a national health disaster in the US. And the same could be said about uh, my country. So um, the government that has been presenting itself as a strong government, as a government to quote, that can do things in comparison to the former governments that were unable to perform projects and were saying all the times, all the time we cannot do it, we, can, we cannot do it. Actually, those governments, which appear to be strong and perhaps even authoritarian, they do not uh, cope with the pandemic well. So what does it actually tell us, uh, this paradox of authoritarian uh, uh, um, uh, governments or strong governments? It actually tells us that to fight the pandemic and perhaps also to fight the climate change, we need not less democracy, but more democracy. 
not less liberalism, but more liberalism. And that we need also new role figures, role models of politicians that are able to, to bring cooperation uh, without displaying this uh, authoritarian streak, because it simply doesn't work. Thank you. We'll come back to <clears throat> this uh, question, I think, in the final round of the, our discussions, if uh, and how the liberal democracies can successfully compete with authoritarian uh, regimes in dealing um, or limiting climate change and turning, transforming our economies. Um, I would maybe, uh, Carolina, uh, just a, a short uh, question. Uh, doubt a little bit your assessment that liberal democracies up to now had been more successful in dealing with uh, COVID-19. Um, if you're looking to uh, Switzerland, to Spain, to uh, France, a lot of other countries now uh, on the top, and, and Europe in general as a continent now is on, on, on the top of uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, wave. Um, I would say, uh, and, and if you're looking to China, which uh, then, um, seemingly, I'm not sure about uh, the reality on the ground in China, but seemingly had been able to uh, cope much more effective with uh, COVID-19 uh, than we. Um, populist regimes have failed. Yeah, populist regimes like uh, Trump in the US or Bolsonaro and, 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 and others. But I still think we are in a deep competition, a kind of systemic competition uh, between liberal democracies and authoritarian regimes also in terms of um, uh, fighting COVID-19. What do you think? Um, so uh, um, I, I hope I, I um, express myself clearly. Yes, this is exactly what I wanted to say. Illiberal populism has failed in, in coping with, uh, with the pandemic. Whereas um, uh, some authoritarian regimes like China are, de are, are dealing uh, quite, quite well. Um, but I, I, I also wanted to, to ask uh, a question which should be perhaps with us without uh, answering it uh, immediately. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, uh, fighting with, uh, with the uh, pandemic uh, in a state is similar to a fighting of the COVID-19 in an in a individual patient. It means that if there are coexisting uh, diseases, uh, the, 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 the disease of COVID-19 will be more severe. And I do believe you can see it uh, also in liberal democracies like France, which has this radical polarization and also um, uh, quite a few conflicts in the public uh, sphere. And uh, here I would see the reason for which France is not coping very well. But the question is actually, is the number of cases the only way you assume whether the pandemic has been dealt with effectively and successfully or not. Because uh, we might say that uh, the, the number of cases is of course extremely important, but in the long term also social cohesion, social trust and solidarity are extremely important. So you can imagine societies which are suffering a higher a number of COVID cases right now, but in which social cohesion, solidarity, and trust are at bigger levels. So we should rather have perhaps a more rich assessment of what uh, successful dealing with pandemic actually is. Thanks a lot. Are there comments from our panelists on this uh, topic? Anyone? If. 
debate around whether or not climate action means that we have to do some restrictions uh, to our liberal democracy. I'm 100% on Carolina's side here but, um, when she said that climate action means that we need more democracy and not less. And I think um, the reason we're now in a state in, in, in terms of the climate crisis where we need action that is so sudden and so strong that some people are wondering whether or not democracies can carry it out is only because we, we missed the last 40 years to act. We've known what's going on for the last 40 years and we didn't act. And if we're looking at why this happened, uh, we are seeing, for example, lobbying groups who pushed uh, immensely against climate action. We're seeing that, um, for example, Exxon and other fossil fuel industries um, were, were blocking um, public awareness about this emergency and thereby hindering action. And all those things are, um, are as Carolina said, an, a lack... Uh, um, yeah, a sign of a lack of democracy and not the opposite. And therefore, in order to make our democracy future-proof and to, to tackle the, the, the climate emergency within our liberal democracies, I think we need to strengthen our democracy in itself. So we can never see climate action apart from action to, to expand and strengthen our democracy. For example, by having stricter control on lobbying groups or um, by example, uh, for example, by uh, establishing more representation for um, groups of people who have not been represented in the past, for example, the young generation. And I think by doing all this, we can actually strengthen our democracy while also tackling climate change, while also re-establishing re the trust in democracy that is so, so uh, deeply needed in order to make our democracies resilient even in times of crises that are coming. Thanks a lot. Um, I would like to, to raise the question if um, this issue, if climate change finally um, needs to, to, to strengthen our democracies, liberal democracies, and, and can't be better dealt with in the framework of liberal democracy with uh, pluralism and public deliberation um, and the, the um, uh, debate on alternatives uh, then by authoritarian top-down regimes. Doesn't this uh, also uh, depend from the way we are thinking um, of the ecological transition. Um, is it more about restriction, restricting uh, consumption, restricting the production, a kind of control and command uh, system, a detailed regulation of, um, let's say, a, a production and uh, uh, our way of uh, living? Or is it more about Let's say innovation. Is it about inventing, reinventing the industrial uh, society? So, what is the, let's say, the, the 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 relationship or the tension between uh, sufficiency, uh, efficiency, and innovation in when we are thinking about um, moving towards uh, climate neutrality, Michael or? Um, Viviane, would you like to jump in? Should I start? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very central question. Um, let me start with my take on the strength of liberal democracy. I think the big strength is that you acknowledge diversity, diversity of values, diversity of worldviews, and that you are able to come up with solutions that at least achieve a compromise between different interests, between different views. So this has a very great potential for innovation, not only in terms of technology, but also in terms of social practices that authoritarian regimes might lack. The big drawback of liberal democracy is that it's slow, it takes time to achieve some kind of compromise because you need debate, you need discussions, you need actually a learning process to actually understand what other groups are thinking um, and actually how you could actually design solutions. And there's a kind of tension that's impossible to um, get rid of. But on the other hand, maybe that's exactly what you need because 
even if you had an authoritarian state who would very well address some of these issues, you might have very important drawbacks like throwing a baby out of bathwater. So if you think about in China, you can easily build huge amounts of renewable energy um, without even consulting the people who are negatively affected. Just think of the Fruit Gorges project where millions of people have been resettled. Of course, that's maybe a quicker way to deal with climate change, but maybe it's not the way we want to have a society. So as a society, if you talk about restrictions, yes, we need some kind of restrictions, but these restrictions cannot come from a top-down approach, cannot come from a authoritarian regime that tells us what to do. These need to be rules that we as a society give to ourselves. And finally, I think what's very important here is that in order to make democracy work, we need some kind of spirit of community. That it's not only that every group, every person thinks, what can I get for myself, but have some sense of uh, altruism to, deal, uh, to understand that certain rules are valuable, even if you don't benefit from them personally, and that you have this kind of spirit that we as a society are in this together, and we develop rules in terms of boundaries, of uh, resource use, of emissions, and then actually think about what you can do to respect those rules, what kind of regulations, what kind of uh, policies are appropriate to achieve these social targets. Thanks a lot, Viviane. Yeah, if you ask whether it's more about restrictions or more about uh, innovation, then I would say um, it's about both. Necessity is the mother of invention. So th there are certainly areas that need to be restricted, but it's not it's not people that we need to restrict. It's basically our fossil way of life that somehow are the fossil fuels that are flowing into our lives that we need to restrict in a way. But it's uh, it's very clear to me also that all the solutions we have on the table, they have come out of liberal democracies. Maybe you can develop something, not maybe, definitely you can develop something better in, in a liberal um, state where, where there's diversity, where there's creativity, where everybody can, uh, you know, try something. Um, maybe then China can basically um, deploy renewables faster at some point, but we've seen all the solutions so far that have come from from diverse and creative societies. So, um, but still they come if there are some restrictions or if there are some values that um, people see that they want to address. So the whole energy transition, all the energy technology or renewable technology comes from people that want that had the idea that the, um, this way, a fossil way of life had to be changed and they start experimenting and then things come out. So I think we definitely need both the restriction of the fossil world, basically, that we've been um, totally, as you said in the beginning, Ralph, that we've totally intertwined with that all our way of life is completely based on how how, how fossil fuels and uh, fossil energy um, are coming into our societies. So that needs to be restricted in a way, and that also leads to innovation and invention that we need. And but we have lots of, of like lots of this innovation we already have. There's lots more that we need. But the thing is, though, you also need the people to, as uh, Michael said, to have this feeling of community. You need people that want to creatively engage with the future. It's not about from uh, in Germany the discussion is often about accepting renewables or something like that. So it shouldn't be about acceptance, because acceptance is more like a stage of mourning or something. It should be about creating the future world together and that's what people need to have the freedom to engage in so i think liberal democracies are definitely more equipped for this thanks a lot i would like to pick up a question from our audience um, related to to our last uh, conversation um, i'm quoting the lack of long-term imagination has been a key problem all along, but do you think people's emotional responses to scientific predictions could be altered by COVID? Maybe I would um, reframe it a little bit. How can we turn fear of the future into the confidence that we will, ab will be able to, to shape the future and create a better future? 
than instead of this thinking that, that we have to um, uh, go back uh, into, into a kind of imaginated uh, past. So uh, this is an emotional thing. It's not only about the narrative. Uh, then it's about, uh, as, you, as you said, Viviane, uh, it's not just accepting the, the necess uh, necessities, uh, but, but creating some kind of um, um, aspiration that we can do better. How can we do this? Maybe I'll, I'll just begin. I think there's a couple of factors that need to be fulfilled in order for people to not despair by a challenge or by a problem, but to be confident to tackle it. And the first one is we need to be aware of the pro problem and we need to understand it. And this has worked quite well with uh, COVID. I mean, at the beginning, we didn't know anything about it. And we, uh, like the science made really quickly a lot of progress in understanding it, but even more so, um, I think that the communication to the public about this problem has worked quite well, which is a big difference to uh, climate change communication. Because um, we've also heard in the beginning, um, someone said previously that um, Corona is much more visible than climate change and this makes climate change more easy to deny. But if we really think about it, COVID is in a way invisible too. We don't see the germs, we don't see what's going on in peop inside of people's lungs if they die from COVID. But this thing has been made visible by the media, by um, seeing it every day on TV, by people addressing it, by people not stopping to talk about it. And we need the exact same thing for climate ch change. And this, this can be possible if we have a different take on it, for example, in the media. So this is the first thing. Then the second thing is people need to be aware of the, of the alternatives to the current state and here too there's a lot of ideas there's a lot of very very inspiring alternatives to our current way of living to our current way of economy and i think part of the reason why people have been um or at least part of a lot of people have been inspired by this uh, first wave of corona was because they saw that everything could be so different and we need more communication so that people don't think that our current capitalism and the climate change uh, cl climate crisis are inevitable but that everything could be different but this also is a an, an task for media for um, politicians for public communication and then the third thing is that people need to see how they personally can make a difference, how they have power to influence the whole change that they want to uh, see going on. And I think that is something that, for example, Fridays for Future and other movements have achieved quite well because they gave people an opportunity to engage. And I think if these three factors are met, then we have um, more confidence than despair in, in the face of crises. Okay, thanks. I would like to pick up an, another question. Um, with all the money spent to fight COVID-19, is there still money, energy, political agreement and motivation left to fight climate change? Uh, maybe we can focus for a moment on the economic aspect of the, the, the question. I think there's a clear um, contradiction uh, now emerging um, between the, the economic recession uh, caused by, by COVID-19 um, and the need uh, for accelerated then investment, for more investment, both private investment by, by enterprises, by companies and public investment for uh, renewing our then transport system, investing in public transport, um, in electrification of uh, then mobility, um, speeding up uh, uh, renewable energies, um, redesigning uh, energy intensive industries like the chemical or the steel industries. This is all about huge amount of investment and at the same time uh, the, the, the economic power of governments and of companies uh, is uh, shrinking as the result of the crisis. How can we uh, than escape this uh, trap. Any ideas? Maybe Michael? Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, actually, I think there's not such a big trade-off between fighting the economic recession and doing something as, against climate change. Because now, due to COVID-19, markets in a 
disequilibrium. And this requires actually some kind of state intervention anyway. So you need to spend money now to actually keep the economy going, to keep people in employment and so on. And actually many things very good like to invest now, which actually have been shown to have large multiplier effect, I mean, large stimulating effect on the economy, um, such as infrastructure investments, are also investments that are very crucial for climate change. So for instance, this would be a very good opportunity to spend money on public transport, on upgrading rail infrastructure, on upgrading electricity grids, on investments in R&D. And actually, there has been very, very recently been a poll among uh, many economists led by some very famous people, such as Joe Stiglitz, Nick Stern. Um, and they asked them which um, measures they actually would recommend in terms of greenery and in terms of um, addressing COVID-19. And actually, they have identified a lot of options that would actually fare very, very well on both accounts. So I'd really encourage you to take a look at this study. Thanks. Another question and a concrete idea, a concrete proposal. I wish there could be an R rating every day on climate change dynamics like on COVID-19 dynamics, regulating our daily life and maybe steering uh, the political action. Could that be possible? So, so what could be um, a kind of... Um, public uh, indicators um, which could raise awareness and um, uh, could guide the uh, policy, uh, policy decisions uh, with respect to, to, to climate change. Perhaps I'll pick this up because I'm very interested in, in uh, this question and also the question that was previously about future and fear. Uh, namely, it's very important now to understand that uh, people uh, in our societies, in my country, but also in your countries, uh, live in a, in a profound state of fear. And fear um, produces rage. I do believe that uh, the example of my country recently is exactly uh, the, makes exactly the point. Uh, you have all probably seen the, uh, the photos, the pictures, the films uh, from the protests uh, in, uh, in, in defense of women's rights, uh, rights in Poland. 100,000 people protesting in Warsaw, 400,000 people protesting all over Poland uh, in, on Friday, on last Friday. This has been, this have been the biggest, the largest protest we have had in the free Poland after 1989. And I do believe this has something very much in common with the COVID-19 pandemic. Namely, people would probably protest anyway, but the state of fear they are in produced even more rage at the decision of the Constitutional Tribunal regarding abortion. So um, what, I, what I would like to stress is that this is a profound challenge for the politicians because if we talk about future and fear in the past decades, we might say just after the Second World War, um, fear was connected with the past. So people didn't want the past to come back. The future seemed to be an open book in which we were to write. Then after 1989, still so, but um, a rising fear of the future appeared. Um, future being the end of the world that we know it. And actually, if illiberal populists won so many elections around the globe in the past few years, it is exactly because they were projecting and expressing this fear of the future, the fear of the world that is ending, the culture that's ending, the societies as we know them that are ending. And now COVID-19 um, is, is, is an extremely important pandemic because it brings fear of having no future. We cannot even plan ahead for two months, four months, because we really don't know what is going to happen. And I do believe that this is a challenge for politicians because if we are talking about uh, efficiency uh, and, and, uh, and, and fighting climate change, it's very important, in my opinion, to, um, to that, that, that there are politicians and there are civic uh, leaders that are able not to uh, 
only show uh, drastic numbers about the future. So not only all the time uh, cause fear about the future, what is going to happen, but also produce a picture, a vision of the future, which is a positive one, which brings hope. If we only uh, scare the, the citizens, the voters, with the visions of the future, I do believe it won't, it won't simply work. Thanks a lot. Um, I would like to um, raise another question from, from our audience. Um, Viviane talked about the need for restriction of uh, fossil fuels, governmental restrictions, policy restrictions, but what about the meat industry? How can governments approach these issues with liberal values? Very interesting question because um, um, our the, the, uh, way of eating, of course, has uh, quite a significant impact on, 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 on global warming and maybe this is the area in which individual change of habits, individual change of consumption uh, uh, and, and, and uh, lifestyles uh, can have the biggest uh, than impact. So what is here the um, uh, relationship between governmental regulation and uh, individual um, uh, change of, of, of uh, lifestyle? Maybe I start because I I was addressed. Um, <clears throat> I think, well, for all of these issues that we're facing, individual behavior is has a role. And but it's also um, that we're seeing this also with, with meat, but also with uh, fossils and so on. We see individual behavior going in the direction of change. <clears throat> Sorry, but it's also something that. Um, the incumbents actually wanted us to deal with, like they wanted us to take the whole uh, idea of a personal carbon footprint of doing something uh, as a single person is, has been also very much um, driven by uh, large industry um, and by the big polluters in a way. So yes, we have a role as individuals in this, as in meat eating as well as in uh, driving or not driving, but we also have a role as citizens, as to actually make our voices heard politically, which then drives this much better, I think, than the individual situations. And when it comes to meat uh, consumption and or fossil fuel consumption, I think something that we haven't spoken very much about it, but we've touched a couple of uh, times is it's basically all these things that are so ingrained in our societies, they have also come in through policies at some point to uh, through favorable policies for them um, that the way we eat, um, the way uh, that meat is very cheap and so on is very much, uh, has very much been driven also by policies that favor um, these kinds of production. Uh, the same with fossil fuels. So I think prices, and that's um, an, a very political idea to actually put a price or a real price on things will help very much with it. Other than uh, that's also already many, many people that are already taking up this uh, spirit. So we, we see meat consumption actually going down as well as beer consumption, um, which is so it's vegan mostly. So <laughs> we should maybe drink more beer and eat less meat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. I've, um, Michael, what do you think? Uh, Viviane raised the, the important the issue of pricing, so the internalization of uh, the environmental cost in the, the market mechanism. Uh, how do you see the potential of um, this instrument uh, regarding uh, CO2 uh, pricing? Um, uh, cap and trade uh, or CO2 uh, like taxes, but more in general, would you say this is uh, the the instrument of choice uh, that we should prefer against um, this kind of nitty gritty regulation and uh, like control approach? Well, 
I mean, I'm an economist, so I'm very much in favor of market-based in instruments. And I think having a price on uh, having a price on carbon emissions is crucial if you want to address climate change. If you don't get the prices right, it will be very hard to have the right incentives in a market-based economy. On the other hand, um, in many instances, it's not the question either or. So having the prices right is very important, but might not be sufficient in some instances, especially in areas of life that are very much connected to social norms, to social values. So think about food, think about mobility, there's more to it. So we need to get the prices right, but that's not sufficient. So we also need some kind of social change. And I think prices can help, but you also need a debate and need to think, how do we want to live as a society? And you might even have bans on certain things um, if you have a social consensus on this. So think about smoking. There's been a huge change in smoking behavior in the last years that actually has not only been driven by prices, but by actually smoking bans and not smoking bans that have been imposed, but where you had a real majority of people advocating these bans, even smokers that actually didn't like um, smoking inside. And if you talk about, for instance, meat consumption, um, well, this is very much driven by not only the prices, but also to routines, to what are you actually used to, what you think is like normal. So if you grow up eating meat every day and you think it's normal, you might actually need some push to be driven out of it and to learn how it um, should could work in a different way. And um, that's also what I would like to build on what has Hannah, what Hannah has said, that you need positive examples. You need to set examples. How could actually our societies work if they were more sustainable? Not only say we must not do that, we must not do that, but frame it in a, in a positive way. What would be a healthy, wholesome food basket look like? What would healthy, wholesome um, mobility patterns look like? How could we all benefit from it and protect the environment at the same time? Um, thanks. Another question. Is there a chance to avoid that after the corona crisis people fall back to their old climate damaging habits? So once again, is it about changing habits or is it about uh, changing the way we are producing energy and food and uh, industrial goods, um, if you take mobility, is it about more or less mobility or is it about smart than mobility? So, um, Viviana already touched this uh, the issue of privatization of uh, the, the climate challenge. Um, changing habits or changing structures and the mode of production? Um, maybe I'll just begin. Anna? Um, I think with regards to this, um, is it more about consuming less or producing differently? This is um, not an either or. We really need both because there's a lot of research also showing scientifically that if we want to manage the transition to renewable production and renewable energy in time to stay uh, within the Paris Agreement and the climate targets, this is only possible if we also reduce consumption at the same time because otherwise uh, nature simply cannot supply the necessary resources that we would need, for example, for um, sustainable traffic or um, yeah, cars that are electrified. Um, so we really need both and if we apply this now to the corona situation and the fact that um, people started, for example, um, driving less, using less mobility, during Corona, but we see that this is um, changing back to the habits before already. Like, for example, right before the lockdown started here in, in Germany a week ago, people were already um, traveling as much as they did before the crisis. So this is really not something that we see happening in the future, but it is already or has been happening that people are going back to their old habits. And... Um, I think here applies what has been said already that when people make personal choices about their everyday consumption and everyday life, they are always embedded in a kind of policy mix that um, drives them or nudges them to making certain decisions. So um, what we need is not only that people think about it differently and become aware, but also that 
the sustainable alternatives to consumption need to be made more attractive and need to be made cheaper. And that's where we really need policy um, to kick in. And as I said, one way of achieving this would have been by the first stimulus, stimulus package that could have um, strengthened um, renewable production much more than it did. It did in some ways, but I think it wasn't enough. But now, as I said before already, uh, we are probably going to see more recovery packages and more stimulus packages, and there's still still a slight chance of using this to really transform our economy and transforming our, our way of life. I would like to come back to the idea that um, reducing consumption uh, should be a substantial answer to uh, the environmental crisis. It's not only about climate change, it's about biodiversity, it's about the loss of fertile soil or the water crisis in big uh, regions of the planet. Isn't that, I would say, a little bit provocative and illusionary uh, than an idea that uh, the answer to these challenges has to be we have to reduce uh, than our, our, our consumption if you're looking to um, the global uh, the dynamics, uh, we are facing uh, an increase in, in uh, world population up to 10 billion people at the midst of the century. We are seeking the rise of billions of people out of poverty to the global middle class. Uh, we are seeing an accelerated urbanization. Uh, the United Nations are, prediction, uh, are predicting that over the next maybe 30 years, uh, the numbers of uh, urban citizens will double, which of course means a lot of construction, a lot of infrastructure, um, a lot of uh, electricity, and so on and so forth. So we are living in a growing world. Uh, whatever we do in, 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 in Germany, if, in, if, we, if we reduce our ecological footprint, uh, to, to half, we are living in a grow, growing world, growing production, growing consumption, growing number of people. So isn't the, the, the core challenge, the crucial challenge to decouple economic growth, the production of wealth from environmental consumption, from environmental degradation on a global scale? I would like to take it from here, it's, if it's possible, because uh, it really rings a bell as for uh, my and Ralph's common interests, as for uh, the, uh, the, 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 the meaning of economic growth and consumption in a global scale, and also when you compare uh, different regions one to another. So I, I, I instantly remembered one of the slogans of the Gilets Jaunes, uh, in France uh, that were saying, uh, when you are talking about the end of the world, we are thinking about the end of the month. And I think it's extremely important. Uh, also, uh, it's, not a, it's not only about France, it's also about my country, uh, where if people, for example, heard that they are expected to consume less and to, to have less economic growth, especially in the economic crisis that has been caused by uh, the COVID-19 crisis, then they would say, well, probably we'll then vote for populists because they don't want uh, us to tighten our belts. So it's, it's very important that we think at the same time about saving climate because we know uh, that, that science is one of the biggest achievements of our culture, but at the same time, democracy also is. So we have to save both things, both, uh, things, both achievements at the same time. So I, I do believe it's not actually about uh, less mobility, it's about better mobility. It's not about a less, uh, less meat just like this. It's, about, uh, uh, it's not about no meat, it's about less meat and better produced meat. So, so uh, again, it, it comes down, it boils down to innovation and not restriction. Michael, as an economist, what do you think? Um, is growth in itself the root cause for the environmental crisis or can we change the nature of growth? Well, um, I think the debate has been way too much about growth. So 
it's very clear that our economies as they are are unsustainable. So they cannot continue growing in the same way they did. So if you use even more resources, you generate even more emissions, of course, this will not keep us in line with any kind of environmental integrity. But on the other hand, if you just trick the economies without changing their fundamental structure, this cannot be sufficient. The way off of achieving any kind of climate target, if you just, even if we were able to cut the global economy in half without changing its underlying structure. So what we really need is to have fundamental structural change. And then if you achieve this change, this kind of decoupling that you mentioned, it will be a different economy. And then it's hard to compare it to what we have now. So I would say, don't talk about growth as such, but really talk about the fundamental changes in terms of institutions, of political changes, social challenges that are necessary to achieve a more sustainable economy. And we have actually called this a sustainable sustainability transition. And maybe I would also like to okay. add on one thing that Hannah said. I think we need all the options. So um, if you regard mobility, so instead of taking the plane, you could take the train, you could have a modal shift. You could also just stay at home and do a video conference. This would actually be avoiding the trip itself. Or you could also, if you want to go to a faraway country, take a plane that's running on zero emissions, either through synthetic fuels or even electric planes, whatever you think of. So all these options are on the table and there's not the one option that will do it all. It's a smart combination of all of them. Viviane? Yeah, I would like to <clears throat> come back to this decoupling also, because I think the re reduction of consumption is uh, is not actually reducing comfort and quality of life. Um, so it's it's a it's a different thing to reduce basically um, all the fossil consumption of the transport sector than to reduce mobility, because mobility is still there even if you don't uh, do it on a fossil fuel. You can do it on a bike, you can do it on your own feet or with many other options that we all are developing also. So I think that's very, very crucial in explaining that, that it's not about taking away your mobility. It's just about making it different, but you will still be as mobile and uh, as happy as you have ever been or even happier because you don't even have to go to a gas station anymore. Um, so we can do it that different was the one and thing better. And, we can do it different and better. Yeah, it can actually be better. And I think and I, there's also very many encouraging signs that people are picking up on that. Um, the other thing, because you mentioned also the uh, gilets jaunes and these things, what we haven't talked about is that there is, there will be people that are not, you know, benefiting from this transition. And so um, the, the whole uh, item of just transition, really, we haven't talked about, but there will be trade-offs for many people. And to, in order to make this go in a way that everybody can benefit is, is then to um, have the societies basically um, deal this out with each other. We've seen this with the coal um, phase out that we that this term came up, but we will see it in the future in many other sectors. And I think it's something that we haven't touched upon enough. Um, what about these people that, that actually have to deal with the trade-offs? Because they, they will be there. And the later we start doing something, the those um, um, blows will be harder. So mm -hmm. we have to kind of mitigate not only, you know, the emissions, but we have to mitigate also all the um, implications it has for many people. And if we don't do that, then the whole thing will fall apart. Um, I would like to bring in another question related to this topic. Um, taking action is a good way, however, how to encounter the anxiety, anxieties of the citizens before the transition due to climate change. So which kind of I would say, accompanying policies then do we need uh, to reduce the fear of change and uh, to raise the confidence of uh, people um, also working class people that they will not fall victim of these uh, change. Who wants to answer? Carolina? 
I would like to answer if I have the answer. Um, because I suddenly started to think that at the time when we are discussing what could be done, could be done to, to fight uh, climate change in a wise way, and then at the time when, when there is this wise question about uh, how to work with people's anxieties, I suddenly realized that anxiety and fear is actually also a very important political fuel which is used uh, on purpose by some political leaders. And here again, I would like to speak about liberal populists, illiberal populists, who are using this kind of what I call a perverted entertainment, um, causing scandals, divisions, and setting, actually putting fire in order to people be anxious, to be emotional, to choose sides. So um, it is, it is a, a, I believe, a, a global question, not only what we do with people's anxieties, because I do believe um, this is not about policies as, as such. This is about leaders and their competence in being uh, empathetic towards people's anxieties, fears, and frustrations. But it's also about political fights and showing that this kind of uh, liberal democratic vision, which is also a vision of a dignified future in a better uh, a, a, situ a climate situation that we have now uh, in, in, in a, let, let's call it very, very uh, um, realistically, a slowdown of the, of the climate change. This would be also already dignified. But, but it's also about convincing the voters that they uh, could vote for this better alternative. Uh, and not only uh, react very emotionally and automatically for those perverted entertainments that are uh, proposed by illiberal pop populists. It's very important that we, that we understand that it's not only about we or politicians contacting the societies, but it's also about an ongoing political fight between illiberal populism and liberal democracy. Yeah, I would add that at the same time it's not only about the kind of language, it's also about concrete then policies, yeah? for instance regional policies or industrial then policies to manage the transition and to reduce the anxieties that the transition will lead into a deep economic and uh, social crisis. So I think the, the, the challenge is that we uh, have to, to transform our uh, in industrial societies um, into a sustainable future without uh, 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 risking collapse. Yeah, because uh, not only the environment, also our societies are very fragile systems, very vulnerable systems. Maybe another question um, directed to Hannah is the Fridays for Future movement the solution for listening to younger voices or do we need a new action plan to start a common dialogue on future challenges? Big question. Yeah, really big and really interesting question also. Um, I think if we're looking at what Fridays for Future has achieved in the last couple of months or years, it has been the solution to parts of the problem, but only parts of the problem. Um, for example, I think that the whole climate issue has been discussed much more broadly in the news and in the public sphere than it would have been otherwise if Fridays for Future hadn't taken to the streets. And um, I think in a way the younger generation has proven that they are able to understand the science, that they are able to understand or think about future challenges and be political and uh, get stuff done, so to speak. And in a way, I can I can feel it, and many other people in my generation feel that like the respect that is brought towards us has grown. We are taken much more seriously, but only so in like the public sphere. Like we are getting invited now to discussions, like the fact that I'm here. Maybe it would have been uh, would have not been possible before Fridays for Future. But politically, 
we're not seeing the changes that we need at all yet. Um, I think this is very evident if you look at like the climate packages that has been passed last year um, by the government, which was celebrated as a success, but like considering that this was uh, after the biggest protest in German history and considering the fact that it's probably not helping Germany to stay within the Paris targets, it, it's not a success after all. And um, I think that this kind of show, Fridays for Future, shows us as a young generation that the kind of forms of protest that we have used so far are just not enough to apply pressure um, on politics and that we need new ways of getting engaged. And um, I mean, this is part of the reasons why a lot of people from Fighters for Future, for example, now start to um, join parties or start to um, run as a candidate for the um, federal election uh, next year here in Germany, because we are trying to like find um, new ways of not only being um, kind of um, opposition out of parliament and talking about stuff and um, trying to apply pressure, but really getting into politics, getting some kind of uh, political power to make things happen. And um, I think this is what we will be seeing much more in the, in the uh, time that's coming. And also what I think is needed um, to make the voices of the younger generation be taken seriously and actually being implemented into um, politics is that we end this, this kind of narrative that we have a conflict between generations here, that it's the young generation who are against the old generation because the old generation has like ruined their future. I think this is deeply wrong. I think that older generations can be as anxious about climate change as we are and that we actually have a common interest here to fight against the kind of destruction that we are seeing um, going on. So I think, um, yeah, the new action plan that we need, so to speak, is to like make the generations work together and ending this generation conflict. And maybe creating also new kind of societal and political alliances. I, I see, you know, with a lot of interest that more and more, uh, for instance, trade unions uh, then are uh, moving, uh, they are adopting the, the climate challenge and moving uh, towards green innovation and also uh, the the industries. I'm just coming from a workshop with Martin Brudermüller, the CEO of uh, BASF, the biggest uh, the chemical uh, the company in, in Europe. And they are not only seriously thinking about reconstructing their, their, their company, they are investing billions of euros uh, in uh, more renewable than energies, in changing their feedstock, uh, so sustainable, uh, using sustainable materials, in recycling. So, final question, are you confidential? Do you see these um, developments with a, with a hopeful than I, or um, do you think we, we are losing the race? Please, all the four of you, quick final statement. So, um, if I may adopt the language that we've seen in the US election, I think it's too close to call. So, <laughs> there are many positive developments. And I mean, the EU Green Deal is a big thing. China announced to be um, carbon neutral in 2060. And if Biden gets elected, if we get the US in, we can really create global momentum and really get to where we need to go. But there are, of course, so many obstacles, political obstacles, lobby groups, inertia by people um, unwilling to change their behavior. So I think the door is open, but we really have to walk through it. Yeah, I would say <clears throat> there's really more momentum that I have seen in uh, the last 10, 15 years of doing this job, but also now we need more momentum than we would have needed 10 years ago. So the verdict is still out because the momentum is there. All the frameworks, at least in Europe, a lot of the frameworks are more or less in place. But what we're not seeing is the action. When I come back to my initial statement, it's really about the next five years. If we really get all the policy instruments that we need, if we get it on the ground, if we measure and then uh, readjust, then I think the momentum actually goes somewhere. But at the moment, we still have, like, the, it's still too close to call. I would also end on that. 
Paulina? Oh, you have to oh my microphone was off. Uh, um, so if I were to 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 continue on this uh, note from from the US, I would say do not stop the vote. Um, it's uh, it, it's important that we understand that we are in the process, and uh, exactly COVID nineteen can teach us here something. Um, we shouldn't actually think about being in post pandemic world because we are in a pandemic world and the same with climate change. We are in the challenge. And I do believe it's important to realize that because only if we realize that we are in the process, we can see the situation that we are in, not as only as a threat, but also as a challenge for human ingenuity. Thanks a lot. Hannah, last sentence. Um, yeah, I feel like this is actually the hardest question of all to answer because <laughs> I'm every day struggling with whether to be hopeful or not. Because on one hand, I see all these really, really disastrous um, consequences of climate change already happening and we have lost a lot already. Like the Earth has now already warmed by 1 or 1.3 degrees and we are really, really close to hitting tipping points and all of this is extremely scary. And at the same time, I see things like you just mentioned, those alliances between actors that had not, would have not been possible before happening and um, what, what moves in society at the moment, that gives me hope. And I think what it all comes down to is the fact that there will never be a point in time where we can say now the climate crisis, uh, climate crisis is decided, now we are all doomed and it's over. But everything we do always matters. Every tenth of a degree of warming that we can avoid matters and um, how we even the consequences that are now unavoidable, how we manage them, how we mitigate them, all of this matters. So the fight will never be over and that's why we all have to stay active. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, also referring to the United States, um, I would say with Joe Biden, keep your faith. And with Barack Obama, we, yes, we can. Yeah, I think we have to strengthen this kind of yes, we can spirit that we are able to turn very dangerous challenges into opportunities to create a better future and to, I would say in my words, to kickstart a green revolution. So thank you very much. Uh, take care and all the best. Bye bye. <laughs>